together. So, uh, on that. Before we get started into everything, I did want to make note of a correction that was a type, typo mistake. It was on page 32, and it talks about um, uh, the books of Acts and Luke, and I have them reversed in there. The, book of, the Gospel of Luke is written, obviously, before the book of Acts, but if you read through there, I left some things out, and it says that Acts precedes Luke, but I should have said that Acts was preceded by Luke, is probably what I was thinking, and so that's been left out. So on page 32, I just want you to know, I do know that the Gospel of Luke was written before the, <laughs> the book of Acts, but uh, that was a typo mistake. And I found a few more as I've gone through here, and you probably will too, um, really, these, the notes were for myself, but I just thought I would share them, share them with you guys. So let me get to where I want to talk about stuff tonight, and then I want to, then we'll pray here in a minute. <clears throat> so the goal on our timeline is I plan on pre teaching through the rest of of the three weeks of October. So. So we do a little bit tonight to talk about ending stuff with the, uh, the historicity or the reli historical reliability of the Bible. I'm going to show you some charts and things tonight that I briefly kind of hit on last week. And then we're going to get into the history of Jesus as a real person. And we're going to take two weeks to do that because I want to go slow through some... Well, I say slow, but I know you guys say I talk fast, and I know I do. But we're going to take two weeks through that, and then one week I think we can wrap up with the... Um, the Gospels themselves, the reliability of the Gospel accounts, and do that. And then, because in the fourth week of, of October, I'm actually preaching a revival that starts that night over at Five Points. So I have to be done by then. So uh, I think some groups might be looking to hang out here or to finish out uh, in some other areas. And after the revival is done, then I will still be teaching uh, just a general Bible study. After that, we'll put this... Uh, apologetic stuff to rest and so other small groups could will be going on probably so just kind of let you know but if you want to just be a part of a general bible study and you're not in something like that we'll just probably end up meeting in here um, or maybe a, a smaller room depending on the the numbers and stuff that we have so a little housekeeping stuff there let me pray for us and then i'm going to get into our study tonight father god thank you for today and just for allowing us all to gather here uh, together father to study your word uh, Father, just to be enlightened by the knowledge of church history to help us to understand how you have preserved your word, your scripture throughout the years, uh, that uh, as what was written in your word, that your word shall not pass away. And Father, you have, have worked through man uh, to fulfill that promise. Father, I pray as we finish up looking at the scriptures and as we begin to look at Jesus, Father, that we can see that there is so much evidence that shows that he was a man of history and the things that uh, were written about him were true. But, Father, we have to move past just the historical facts and figures and dates. Father, we have to make that decision to choose to believe uh, in his message that he taught. Primarily, Father, that he was the Messiah, that he died for our sins. And so, Father, that takes an element of faith to choose to believe in that. And so I pray that we never forget that even though we study these uh, evidences, Father, that you have left room for faith because, as your word says, without faith it is impossible uh, to please you. So, Father, uh, help us to keep that in mind as we study your word. Father, just thank you for this time, and we commit it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I wanted to pick up, this is the where I was last week. Um, I wrote it down. You'd probably be about page 42 or so as we talk about the early church fathers writings and and how they had quotes from the new testament if we did not have any of the new testament literature any of the new testament books of the bible we could recreate almost the entire new testament just by the quotes that we have of the early church fathers and what they said and so here's a couple of them we have justin martyr there uh, you can see his time frame there. He has about 330 references that he will make of various books uh, within the New Testament. Irenaeus does about 1,800. You get Clement of Alexandria, another early church father. You can see these guys are all within the, that first generation, second generation uh, uh, church fathers there. He's at 2,400 plus. But then you get to Origen. Origen's very, very important. He has nearly 18,000 
references that he will make of all the different books. And I wrote some of them down. I mean, Clement of Rome, he talks, he, he references the Gospels, all four Gospels, the book of Acts, the book of Corinthians, the book of Titus, the book of Hebrews, which is interesting because Hebrews is a debated book sometimes among people, uh, who the author is, because we don't know who the author is, but he is quoting it in the book of 1 Peter, and some debate about 1 and 2 Peter, uh, the authorship of that, because the Greek is a little different than other writings, and so it's possible that Peter was using someone else to write the letter, as Paul did. We call that an amenuensis, and that's someone who writes uh, a, a letter on behalf of someone else, like back in the day when you know the boss would dictate and the secretary would write it down and that sort of thing there. And I remember in typing class, you had to you put your initials right down at the bottom as the one who typed who typed the letter, even though you weren't the one who originated it. And all. anybody remember that? Some of you did that. Okay, yeah. I only took typing because I was young and we had a female teacher who was new, and every young guy wanted to be in the typing class with the female teacher. So that's why I learned typing was because of her. But uh, I don't even know why I told you that, because now it's out there on the video. But anyway, <laughs> I say this. My, that teacher's going to find me and go, I knew that's why he was taking typing, because he was no good. So uh, Ignatius, he writes about Matthew and John, the book of Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and, and different things. Polycarp, I've talked about Polycarp before. Uh, he will talk about Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, uh, the book of Timothy, which is a prison epistle, Hebrews as well, First Peter, and the books of John. Even Psalms and Proverbs he will talk about, and the book of Isaiah. Uh, obviously really important, especially like Isaiah 53, suffering servant passage predicting about Jesus. Here's a couple of other people. Are you clicking or am I? Am I doing something? Oh, okay. Uh, no, not yet. There we go, I clicked backwards. Uh, Hippolytus, uh, their uh, references, and Eusebius. So uh, I know you probably don't know these people. I just want you to see, and that's why I gave you the notes, because I know as I'm going through this, you're like, I don't know these people. Well, you wouldn't unless you're reading this stuff, but that's why you have the notes. I just want you to see the numbers and the information that we have out there that the early church fathers were quoting from the New Testament letters. And the, the closer we can get and the more amount of people that we have that are quoting these things when they were able to talk to people who knew the original writers. So when you go to Polycarp, who knew John, the Apostle John, and Polycarp will quote something from John, you see he's close enough that would, someone would know that Polycarp, they could debate on something. He could say, no, I, I talked to John. This is what John said. You know, and so that's why we want to have uh, this chain of custody. If you're in... The, if you're in, in um, dealing with um, evidence in a legal sense, chain of custody matters, right? You need to know. I had a friend uh, who, who was in the police department, and uh, there was a problem because he had picked up a weapon, he had placed it in a bag, and then he had, he had given it to somebody, and uh, that, you know, it, had, it had stayed within the police department the whole time, but the way the discussion went down was uh, that he had forgotten that he had taken it, he had given it to somebody, like a, another sergeant or something, and then placed it in the bag, and, and that was left out. When the attorney found out about it, they said, well, no, your statement says you picked it up, you placed it in the evidence bag and this, and left out that you picked it up, it was given to, I think, the sergeant on duty or whatever, and then he placed it in the evidence bag, then you took it to the evidence locker. And so, you know, the chain of custody was broken from his statement, and it got thrown out and that sort of thing. So, understanding the chain of custody of the scriptures from the original writings who was the next person who heard it so john writes next chain of custody would be polycarp polycarp writes who's copying polycarps and we want to go uh we want to find that chain and we'll talk about this more uh in the last lecture that we have about the uh the credibility of the gospels because we can go back and find those chain of custody people and we can bring them uh many of them up to the oldest copies that we have that I talked about last week when we started talking about those old copies. If we can get back to 300, 400 AD, we can get a chain of custody from 300, 400 AD forward because we have that original copy or that copy from that time period, not the original, but the copy from that time period. So we need to establish a chain of custody from there to the original writer. Does that make sense? I'm trying not to be confusing about it all. Okay. It says here... <clears throat> 
Besides textual evidence de delivered from New Testament Greek manuscripts and from, nearly, uh, from early versions, the textual critics has available the numerous scriptural quotations included in the commentaries, sermons, and other treatises written by the early church fathers. So besides just the copies, we have the sermons that they wrote that reference things back to that. And he goes on to say, I forget, I need to do yours as well. Indeed, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be totally, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. And uh, Erdman there is a, uh, uh, a linguistic scholar for uh, ancient texts and stuff. So he's saying if everything were gone and all we had were just the sermons and the writings of these early church fathers, we would be able to create them. This is a chart that's in your book. I know it's probably, well, these, it's a little bit bigger to see up here. But all I have in there is the language in which that copy was made, the earliest manuscript that we have, and it, you have two columns. One says old and new. Uh, that's on there because some people are dating it. The old date was considered this. And then under new scrutiny, then they have a newer date. And some of those dates haven't changed a whole lot, but some have. Like if you look at the Syriac one, the old date was the 5th century. The earliest new date is late 4th or early 5th century and those sorts of things. But you can see the number of manuscripts and, um, that we have there. But the interesting thing is when you come down to the bottom and you look at that, the total Greek and non-Greek manuscripts we have is about 23, almost 24,000 that we have in there. And then you start adding up Greek manuscripts, early New Testament translations, Old Testament scrolls and codices there, which is about 42,000. You get 66,286 scrolls, codices, manuscripts of the New Testament. The New Testament and the Old Testament are by far the most substantiated of any ancient writings that we have, of, of, of any of them. We have more copies, more codices, more scrolls of New Testament and Old Testament scripture, the canon, different various books, than we have of any other uh, ancient documents that we have. And this is why I told you, here's the chart. The average classical writer, if you stacked all their stuff up, would be four feet high. That's how many copies, how many pages, how many codices we have of the average classical writer. So you say, well, how much do we have of Plato? About four feet high. How much do we have of Socrates? About four feet high. When we start to put all of those together, for those of you who remember, the World Trade Center, World, uh, Tower 1, was about 1,792 feet tall. So there's the... Uh, a comparison there. The New Testament would be one mile tall if we stacked up all those stuff. The Old Testament would be a mile and a half if we had all of those stacked up. So combining our Old and New Testament, we would have two and a half miles high pile of codices, scrolls, fragments, pieces of the evidence. There's no other ancient documents or, or ancient writings that we have are so close. Now, to be fair, I put these down in here so you can see the years and stuff. Some of them are good. Some of them have a lot. So I tried to do like the oldest stuff that we have coming forward. You talk about Homer's Iliad, right? You've heard about the Iliad and the Odyssey. You probably had to read some of that in school. And you can see the dates written. The earliest manuscripts that we have is still 500 to 400 years later. The, um, the time span in there and the number of copies. So you look at those numbers there. On the very far right column, you got 1900, 106, 226, 238, you know, 251, 430. You know, uh, you come down to this last speech of Demethenes, De, whatever, how you ever say that guy's name, Demethen, whatever, you know, uh, 444 down there. So you got about 4,000 of these writings here total, things that we talk about, like Tacitus Annals and, and all those different things. And you stack that up just against the New Testament, and we have over 24,000. And in the New Testament, remember, we have that, the, the John Ryland papyri fracture, uh, little fragment I was showing you, had the, had the uh, written on both sides, the Gospel of John, there's a picture in your notes there. That's our earliest fragment we have, and that's within 25 years of the original writing, because that's dating back to about 125 A.D., 
And you know that John is writing, you know, sometime in the late 90s, the gospel. He's the longest living apostle and that sort of thing there. So, um, you know, we can, we can put gospel writings there. Now, not every gospel thing, and, and this, I don't want to misconstrue this, not every writing we have is within 25 years, but we, have, we are much closer. In fact, the entire New Testament is less than, less than 300 years from the original writings, and some of, it's about, some of it's even closer than that to less than 200 years when we have an entire book, but we have parts of books that are within under 100 years. And so we have... I put those charts in there so you could see that. Let me back up to this one here. So I made a couple graphs for you to see as you can look on this one here. <clears throat> the Old Testament writing spans about from 1400 to 400 BC, about a thousand year writing span there of when we actually are getting the writing. The, the, the time frame uh, is much earlier because uh, Abraham is probably about 2000 years before Christ. But um, <clears throat> when Moses is writing, it's around 1400. So we have that time span. From the earliest Old Testament manuscripts that we have, we started to find those with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were dated back to 250 BC. You remember me talking about this last week. And in the Dead Sea Scroll findings, every single Old Testament canon book is represented within that find. You heard me talk about that before. We don't have the complete books of all of them, but every single Old Testament book is represented there. There is a fragment or sections or pages of every Old Testament canon book within the Dead Sea Scrolls find in the Qumran caves. They are dated between 125 to 250 BC. So if we take the, uh, the older of the dates, they're 250 BC, we're talking about a 150 year span of time from when the canon was closed in the Old Testament to when we got our oldest copy of those books. That's not a very long span of time there. So that's in the green. Then we have up on the top, then we have, you have like Plato's writings there and uh, the earliest copies we have. Now there's a time span of about 47 years. That's pretty good. But the number of copies does not equal anything close to the New Testament. When you come over to the, that, the blue blocks there on the top, right? The New Testament's writings between sometime between the 40s and 90s A.D. The earliest New Testament manuscript, 117, that John Ryland's one, 27 year span from in there. Most of the New Testament we have in 200 A.D., so 110 year span from the time of it when it closed within there. You're talking within a generation, generation and a half. Like, you know, somebody's grandfather is going to be, would have been able to remember and say, well, I remember grandpa talking about, you know, John's sermon or Peter saying this when they were seeing these, these copies of the canonized New Testament. So uh, very close. The bottom of that is just uh, comparison to other ancient text so you have like homer's iliad there the time span is 500 uh sophocles play and the time spans 100 years within his uh herodotus's history the time span there 275 and you can look at all the numbers i don't want to bore you with all of the numbers there but what i want to show you is that most people do not debate these other ancient texts They'll say, oh yeah, that, you know, when, we, when we read the Iliad and the Odyssey, that, we have it. We know this is what they wrote. But, they will, but they will, the same types of people oftentimes will look at the New Testament or the Old Testament and say, oh no, we can't believe in that. I'm like, well, you know, if your literary criticism, we call this higher criticism, higher and lower criticism, uh, the standards that you put on these other ancient texts, when you apply them to the religious texts, like the religious texts far outweigh them. And the reason they don't do that is because if you, if, you, if you acknowledge the religious texts, you are obligated to the teaching within the religious text, right? So a lot of people try to, try to disprove that. Same reason that we have evolution problems, because it's just a theory. We teach it as a fact, but it is a theory of creation, and that's fine. If people want to teach a theory, I'm okay with that, you know? to say this is a theory. I don't agree with it. I like to show the creation story of the Bible and the evidence that we have for that. But the reason that we teach these things and that we hold on them so much is because if we acknowledge the biblical text, we are now accountable to a moral law giver. 
We do not like to be accountable to a moral lawgiver. So if we can discredit the moral law, I don't have to listen to the moral lawgiver. Does that make sense? So when people fight this, they're not even fighting with science. They're fighting because of political reasons and stuff like that. All right? um, I don't want to get too political into everything now, but like we've just gone through this period of COVID, right? Where we have science that talks about masks and all that. And we're realizing and we use the words of vaccines and all that. And yet people still get sick with COVID. Well, if they get sick, it doesn't seem to me that it would be, should be called a vaccine, you know, or the mask and all that. You know what I'm saying? The science doesn't always line up, but there are political views, and everybody comes down on different sides of that. Well, the same thing happens with religion and with the workings of the Scripture. And I just want us to understand that, that, that if you were just looking at it just by evidence, you have to accept that the Bible is a valid document written and that what we have was written back in the original times. But then there's that element of faith. Are you going to choose to believe what was written in there about God, that God loves you and he's a creator God and all that? This next one here just shows you some more time spans of various writings. Some of them are, some of them are, are somewhat close and some of them are not. I want it to be fair and just let the evidence say what it is. It doesn't matter to me if there's an ancient document that's close. I have so much evidence in the New Testament, which is what I'm most concerned with, I just want you to understand that when we treat all these documents fairly, the number of, of evidences for the, for the scriptures of what we have is just, is just amazing. All right, that's all I want to say about that because you guys have read the rest of that. I don't, for some reason, I'm not able to click forward. There we go. So let's move over in to talk about the thing I really like uh, more than any of the other subjects we deal with, and that is talking about the historicity of Jesus. My faith is bolstered in the person of Christ. That helps me to believe in all the other stuff because I have so much evidence about Jesus, his, uh, his walking on the earth, his ministry, his resurrection, the crucifixion, and all that. And if Jesus is a real person and he rose back from the dead, as we have all these evidences attesting to that, then when he talks about Jonah, when he talks about creation, when he talks about all those things, that's good enough for me, okay? That's where my faith lies. Now, you have to decide for yourself, but, that's where, but Jesus is the hinge pin for my faith for everything. I don't start with creation and then come to Jesus. For me, I start with Jesus, and that brings evidence to all of the rest of them. But that's just, that's just my, my walk. Let's ask, was Jesus a real person of history? This is what I want to show over the next two weeks, that Jesus is a real person of history, and the things that the Bible wrote about him did happen. And not only did Bible people write it, but there were people outside of the Bible who wrote about it, who said that these were the stories that people said about him, and this is what was claimed about him. And this is why I said, there's no way you can walk away after these next two weeks and say that Jesus wasn't a real person in history. Now, whether you want to believe him as your Lord and Savior, that is a theological discussion. That's a doctrinal issue. That's a faith issue. But history is the fact, right? Jesus walked the face of the earth. Whether you believe he's God or not, there's an element of faith there. So my focus is not to convince you that he's the son of God. That would be a sermon I would do on Sunday. What I want to convince you is he is a real person of history, and you have reason to believe when you say, I believe that Jesus exists. And someone goes, oh, that's made up. You're like, no, he's not made up. You don't know your history. I want you guys to know your history, okay? So that's the goal. All right, so... Let's talk about some friendly sources, people who would have a reason to say good things about the gospel. Obviously, the four gospel accounts, right? Matthew, who's one of the original disciples, he was a tax collector. Jesus came to him and said, leave your tax collecting booth and follow me. Then we have Mark. Mark is not one of the original 12 disciples, but he wrote down a gospel account based on Peter's recollection. So Mark... Uh, teams up with Peter in his ministry and as he's sitting around the campfire talking whatever Mark is writing down Peter's account of Jesus's interaction and so Mark puts his name to it because he's the author but the information comes from from Peter Peter will say this in second Peter for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit and I've used this before Peter reminds them we didn't make up these stories but the Holy Spirit 
carried us along as we wrote them from their perspectives. Then we have Luke, Luke the physician, right? He's not one of the original 12 disciples either. But he conducted personal interviews and eyewitnesses for his gospel account. Luke went and talked to Mary. Luke went and talked to probably some of the shepherds. Luke went and talked to the the people in the synagogues. Luke went and talked to everybody he could because he says, I went and talked with them. And that's why when you read Luke's account, there are things in Luke's account that you don't see, uh, especially about the birth narratives and stuff. I mean, how did Luke get the story about Jesus when he was at 12 in the temple and being, uh, being lost there? I mean, he wasn't lost. His parents left town. That's what they did. That's what happened. And I've told you a little bit about that. At 12, a Jewish boy was at a pivotal age where he could, he could now go with the grown men and be with them in the synagogue. But he was also young enough that he was still considered able to stay with the women and the younger children which is probably why they lost him because mary's probably thinking he's 12 he's with uh, joseph and the other men and joseph's thinking he's 12 he's with mary you know he's like that junior high age right you know he, you know one day he's playing with toys and the next day he's trying to do adult things and whatever and uh, so i just wonder what they looked at each other and just said you lost the son of god you know and, and they just i didn't lose him you lost him you know and it's like oh my but anyway, uh, Luke got that because he went and he talked to Mary. And so he was able to tell that story, and that's why we have that story about Jesus. And then we have the Gospel of John. John is one of the original 12 disciples, right? He's the longest living apostle, uh, and he personally eyewitnessed the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. In fact, to be an apostle, you had to physically uh, witness the risen Savior. Paul is an apostle because Paul does see the risen savior we see him on the road to damascus jesus speaks to him and all but paul will talk about uh, his time in arabia jesus coming to him and different things and teaching him so that's why paul is considered an apostle one as paul says untimely born he was not with the rest of the apostles he's he's trying to destroy the church he comes later but uh, he did see the resurrected lord and certainly was called by him uh, here's a uh, passage in John 21. This is the disciple who bears witness of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his, test of, that, that his witness is true. John is just saying, I wrote these things down. You know me, you know my life, and I know that what I wrote is true. I didn't make any of this up. And then in John 19, 35, the man who's solid has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. And in the end, John will talk about all of these things were written so that you would believe in Jesus as the Son of God. So all the stuff that they have, they wrote down not to bring any glory to themselves. It's not like they were selling books. It's not like they were, you know, uh, prize-winning authors. They wrote this down because... Jesus told them to go and share the gospel, go and share the good news. And so they wrote it down. Their livelihoods turned uh, from the moment that Jesus was resurrected to preaching the gospel. In fact, all of them die martyred death, right? You can go through church history and read about it. Some of them is recorded in Scripture, and some of it is just recorded through church books. But they all died a martyr's death. And I had someone say one time that, well, people, you know, go, will anyone die for a lie? Yes. There are people who die for a lie. There are, I mean, those who flew the, the, the planes into the Twin Towers, they believed a lie. They died for the lie, right? They're going to see Allah. They're going to have their 72 virgins and all that. They died for a lie. But will people knowingly die for a lie? See, those people believed it was the truth. But if you knew it wasn't the truth, would you die for a lie? Would you be tortured for a lie? maybe one or two, but I can't see where all of them who, if they knew it was a lie, if they knew Jesus' resurrection was a lie, why would all of them go to a martyr's death? I, I, I can't, I just can't see that happening. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's like saying, you know, if you knew it was a lie, getting punished, at some point, you're like, why am I getting punished? I know I'm, t I know I'm telling a lie. You, you wouldn't continue to get punished. Maybe, maybe one or two would, but I can't imagine 12 13, 15, 1,000 people, you know, they would not. All right, so then we have the Apostle Paul. 
He's another friendly source, right? And I talked a little bit about him. Uh, he believed that Jesus was a real person who rose from the dead. Talked to him on the road to Damascus. It says, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to show his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. And you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. This was about Paul. Luke is recording the interaction that Paul had on the road to Damascus. Paul will then say in 1 Corinthians when he's trying to talk about the resurrection of Jesus in 15, that whole chapter is about the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then we have no hope as Christians. And he says, then he appeared to James. This is talking about Jesus. He appeared to James, which is Jesus' half-brother, a leader in the Jerusalem church, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, meaning one born out of the normal time. All right, let's talk about some other friendly sources. Let's talk about the early church fathers. There's five or six guys here. We have Clement of Rome. He knew the apostles Peter and Paul, so he would be, you have Peter and Paul, apostolic fathers. Then we have first generation early church fathers, and that would be Clement. These guys knew these guys, okay? First generation guys. He died in 100 AD. He died because they took an anchor and they tied it to his body. They threw it over into the sea and drowned him because he wouldn't recant Christ. If you guys saw the remake of the movie Midway, did any of you see the remake of the movie Midway? Had the Jonas brother guy in there? Did nobody see that in this room? You know, they, in that scene, right, they tie him to an anchor. He gets captured by the Japanese destroyer and they tie him to an anchor and he won't tell and they, and they throw him overboard and the anchor takes him down to his death. That's what happened to this man because of his belief in Jesus. Most likely, he is the Clement referenced in Philippians 4, 3. Here is a page of writing from 1 Clement, and this is what it says. <clears throat> the apostle received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent forth from God. So then, Christ is from God, and the apostles are from Christ. Both, therefore, came of the will of God in, in the appointed order, having therefore received a charge and having been fully assured through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and confirmed in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth with glad tidings so the kingdom of God should come. So preaching everywhere in the country and town, they appointed their first fruits when they had proven them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons unto them that should believe." A lot of stuff that he's saying in there but he's obviously talking about jesus he's talking about his resurrection he's talking about their preaching he's talking about the spirit of god he's talking about all of these things to him this is not a made-up individual is it this is a real person of history so then we have a man by the name of ignatius he is a bishop of antioch and he writes a letter to the trillions and that's a city in, uh, it's an ancient city that would be in modern day Turkey now. Um, Trellis, T-R-A-L-L-E-S, I think is the name of the city. Um, but he references Jesus Christ and he dies a martyr in the Colosseum, Ignatius does. He dies a, dies a martyr in the Colosseum by lions. He was taken by ship different places. Eventually they get him into Rome and... Um, uh, there were people who bartered for his freedom, but he said, no, I don't want this. I'm looking forward to dying because I'm going to go see Jesus. And in 107 AD, they throw him in the Colosseum and he was consumed by two lions. And that's why there's this picture that's been made of him here uh, in uh, ancient, or not ancient, I don't want to say ancient, but old uh, codices that talk about uh, uh, Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch. But he said this, Jesus Christ who was of the race of David, which is a way of saying he's of the line of David or the house of David, right? Who was the son of Mary, who was truly born and ate and drank. Why do you think he'd say that? He's a real person. He's not made up. He was really born. He ate. He drank. He was human like you and I. Because there was a time when people were trying to say that Jesus was not really an individual. He wasn't real bone, flesh and bone. He just looked that way. John has to deal with that. The Gnostics were trying to say that. And that's why John, in his gospel, is talking about Jesus. And he talks about him being deity, but he also talks about him being a man. 100% man, 100% God. And Ignatius is picking up on this idea of 
He was a real person. He ate. That's why when Jesus was resurrected, it says that he said, give me a piece of broiled fish. And he ate a piece of fish in front of him because ghosts don't eat fish. All right? Ghosts don't eat at all, but real people do. He ate and drank. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate was truly crucified and died in the sight of those in heaven and on earth and those under the earth who moreover were truly raised from the dead. Remember, there was a resurrection of tombs when Jesus came back. He was, there, the, it says the tombs broke open. There were other people who came to life for a time. They obviously died again, but there was a resurrection of others. His Father having raised Him, who in the like fashion will so raise us also who believed on Him. Clearly, he sees Jesus as a real person in history. Let's talk about some unfriendly pagan sources of limited evidential value. I wouldn't die on this hill of evidence, but every bit of evidence helps a little bit. Sometimes it's limited because you're like, well, this is missing. The time frame could be off a little bit. You know, there's there's always a little bit of something. But taken as a whole you know, the preponderance of evidence is pushing. It helps to move things forward. So one of those guys is a guy by the name of Thallus. He lives around 5 to 60 AD. So he would have lived in that time when Jesus was around. He's possibly the oldest non-believer to mention Jesus in writing that we have. His original writings have been lost to history. So we don't have his autographed original writing. What we have is his quote by a, name, by a man by the name of Sex, Sectus Julius Africanus. And uh, he lives around 220 A.D., and he tries to explain three hours of darkness. Thallus is going to talk about the three hours of darkness, and here's his writing. And in all of these, I put a picture that I went and found. They're not in your notes, but I found photos or you know, drawings or boff reliefs or whatever of these individuals, and I put them on the slides here so you can see that these were real people. People knew these people because they were high political officials or philosophers. They weren't just made up individuals. But he writes, uh, Julius Africanus writes, quoting Thallus, On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus in the third book of history, calls as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. So he's talking about this, this, the, the darkness that came, the earthquake that came, and Julius Africanus is saying, he called it an eclipse, that doesn't make sense to me. That's what he's saying. Now, how he debated that is not my issue. My issue is, the value of this is, he talks about the earthquake, he talks about the hour of darkness, and these things happened within the story of Jesus. So what I've done is put a little chart here to show you the weaknesses of the evidence and the strength for the evidence. In this particular one, the weakness is Jesus is not directly mentioned, doesn't use his name. But the strengths of it are he mentions the location of Judea, which is the region where Jesus was crucified. He mentions that there was an unexplained darkness that covered that region, which we know happened. He mentions that there were seismic activities that accompanied this particular darkness. And all of these events are recorded in the gospel accounts as having happened during the crucifixion of Jesus. Here's the passages of Scripture. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split, Matthew 27. And then in Luke 23, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. So we have a gospel account talking about these things. We have a secular individual talking about these things. And even though Jesus' name is not there, we can still look at the event that took place. There's no other writing or or event that happened where there was this hour of darkness and this seismic activity that were tied together other than the crucifixion of Jesus. Another individual is Suetonius. He is a Roman historian. He's a court official of Emperor Hadrian. And you might know a little bit about Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian was the one who built the wall across Great Britain called Hadrian's Wall. And they walled off the northern part of Great Britain from the southern part because the Roman Empire was trying to conquer 
the, uh, the, the, the native tribes that were there, but they were struggling with the tribes of the north, so they built that great big wall about it. And, and if you've seen the movie, I, I don't know if it's called King Arthur or whatever, but where the people are in blue, they're painted up blue, and, and he's, he's a Roman soldier, and it's kind of the legend of how King Arthur started. That's Hadrian's wall there. And those people literally did uh, dress themselves up in a blue dye, and it was to scare the Romans because they were like ghosts of the night and, and interesting things. So a lot of history there. But you can go over to Britain. I know some of you don't care about any of this, but you can go over to Britain, and you can see parts of Hadrian's wall still there, the foundations and stuff that they laid. Anyway, that's this guy. Has nothing to do with what I'm talking about here, but I just think it's interesting. So useless knowledge that I have in my head. But he speaks about the treatment of Christians under the rule of Claudius. So this is what he says. Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, he expelled them from Rome. Now, here's the problem. Let's look at the, let's look at the good and the bad. The weakness for this evidence is they use a word here, Christus, and it is not the Latin version of uh, Christ. That is Christus, okay, with an I, not an E. But some feel that Suetonius is possibly speaking of some other person in history named Christus. That's why they say, I don't know about this. They're talking about somebody else. Let's look at the strengths of the evidence. There is evidence of the name of Christus being used among the Gentiles. Okay, so the Gentiles wouldn't know about Christ. Christ wouldn't be in their vocabulary because Christ is a Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one. It is a religious term. The, the Gentiles have no care about a Messiah, so they wouldn't use the word Christ. So it seems possible that there would be a corruption of the word. I wouldn't die on this hill. It's just possible. Because the name Crestus was very popular among the Gentiles, it seems logical that Suetonius used this spelling when he's referring to Christ, because he's not a believer, but he might have heard the Gentiles saying it. If someone said, well, that's a tomato, right? Well, it ain't a tomato. It's a tomato, right? And if you guys don't believe that, you're wrong, but you'll still get to heaven. But anyway... We hear words in a certain way, like when we hear the word ka, pocked in hava yad, right? It's not a ka, it's a car. Now, I don't know why they call it a ka, but that's what they call it. But so you can understand how they may have misunderstood or heard that. Once again, I wouldn't die on that hill. But the event that he's talking about is recorded in the book of Acts where they were expelled. And we know that Suetonius wrote about Nero, Emperor Nero, when he blamed the burning of Rome on the group of Christians because he needed a scapegoat. Almost everybody in history believes that Nero lit the fires that burned through Rome because Nero needed property in the city so he could build and property was so expensive he couldn't buy it so he just burnt the city down and then uh, that's why it says Nero was playing the harp as Rome burned, right? Uh, so that he could now buy the ashes of the property that was destroyed and that sort of thing. But we know that this took place because in Acts chapter 18 it says there he met this talking about Paul there he met a Jew named Aquila a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome and Paul went to see them the Jews were being driven out of Rome and this is a, 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 a Priscilla and Aquila the team that will meet up with uh, Apollos and teach him a more pure way of the gospel they were being driven out which seems to indicate that what suetonius was talking about it was probably just a mis just a corruption or a mispronunciation of jesus's name once again limited value i don't want to die on this hill you know rich you wouldn't use someone this this wouldn't be the deciding factor Ooh, you're going to jail right not enough here not enough all right but it we're starting to add more on this plate, right? We're going to tip these scales here. The next guy is Pliny the Younger. I don't know what about Pliny the Older happened, but we have Pliny the Younger, okay? <laughs> he lives around 61 to 113 AD. He's governor of Bithynia, so he's a, a royal official. He writes to Emperor Trajan. Trajan is a neat emperor. Uh, there's a tower, Trajan's, Trajan's Tower, 
that is carved out, and it has Trajan's um, uh, uh, um, his campaign stuff is written around this high tower. Uh, if you've ever known anything about them, but there's a uh, there in Rome there's a there's a tower that's carved. It was carved out of the hillside, and it's the same level as the hillside where they carved out and, and built this shopping complex, and then there and Trajan is the one. But anyway. Uh, Trajan is punishing Christians who refuse to renounce their faith. And so this is what he says. All venerated your image. That means they honor your image like a god. This is where emperor worship becomes, emperors start becoming like deity during these later emperors, right? And the images of the gods as the others did and reviled Christ. So they're turning their back on Jesus. They also maintain that the sum total of their guilt or error was no more than the following. They had met regularly before dawn on a determined day, right? Paul talks about on the first day of the week, we gathered together for the breaking of bread, as was our custom, right? And they sung antiphonally hymns to Christ. So they, they, had some, they had some acapella singing here as if he was God. They also took an oath, not for any crime, but to keep from theft, robbery, and adultery, not to break any promise, and not to withhold a deposit when reclaimed. Their, their, their crime was, we said, we're going to be good citizens. We're not going to steal, we're not going to rob, we're not going to break anything up, you know, whatever. That was their crime, but they were being persecuted, and so they were recanting their faith. And that's what he's talking about uh, in here. So let's talk about the evidence here. What's the strength and what's not? The weakness is, this is not a first-hand account of the historical Jesus. Okay? The strength of it is that Christ is mentioned by name and people were encouraged to curse him, which shows that plenty and others believed him to be a real person because they, they wanted him to denounce Jesus. Well, do you denounce made-up individuals? No, you denounce things that are real. And so they wanted him to denounce that. New Testament scholar Paul Barnett noted that the ancients would never have cursed a God and yet they are encouraged to curse Christ thus seeing him as a man and not deity. They don't see him as the Savior. They just see him as some religious leader that was causing problems, and we want you to denounce his name, like, some, like other rabbis that they would have maybe not liked. Here's another one. Mara Bar Serapion. He's around AD 70. We don't know his lifetime, but this is about the time of his writing. He's a Syrian philosopher and he writes a letter to his son juxtaposing several philosophers. I never knew what the word juxtaposing meant. In my junior high English class, I wrote a paper uh, on uh, A Tale of Two Cities, which we were supposed to read. I didn't read it. I watched the book, and then I wrote a paper as if I read it, okay? And so he wrote on my paper, he said, great juxtaposition. And I thought, I have no idea what that says, but I'll take it. I went and read up that Lord. It means to put two things side by side and to compare them with one another. All right? So that's what he's doing here. Some of you probably already knew what that word meant, but I didn't. It was on my English paper. Thought I'd share it with you. Once again, useless knowledge that you probably don't care about. Listen to what he says. What good did it do the Athenians to kill Socrates? For which deed they were punished with famine and pestilence. What did it avail the, the Simeans to burn Pythagoras, right? And that's okay with me because of his math theories that made me fail in a lot of math classes. But since their country was entirely burned under, or buried under sand in one moment. Or now here, listen. Or what did it avail the Jews to kill their wise king since their, since their kingdom was taken away from them from that time on? And then he says... God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of famine. The Sameans were flooded by the sea. The Jews were slaughtered and driven from their kingdom and everywhere living in dispersion. Socrates is not dead, thanks to Plato, nor Pythagoras because of Hera's statue, nor is the wise king because of the new law which he has given. Now, if you know anything about Jesus, you're thinking... Jesus said, I've come to establish a new kingdom. I've come to establish a new covenant. I've come to establish a new law. You remember when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he said, you have heard it said, but I tell you, an eye for an eye, but I tell you, 
pray for your enemies and those sorts of things there? Let's look at the evidence. Mara never uses Jesus' name directly. That's the problem. Doesn't use Jesus. Okay. But the strength of it. No one else in history fits being considered a wise king of the Jews just before their expulsion and the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Do you remember what they said when they were, when they were crucifying Jesus and they got ready to crucify him? They said, we have no king but Caesar. We don't have a Jewish king. We have no king but Caesar. But when Jesus was crucified, what did Pilate write on the, the plaque that was above his cross? The king of the Jews. And the Jews said, take it down and make it say, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, I've written what I've written. So when people looked at that, they saw king of the Jews, king of the Jews. We know that Mara was not a believer because he places Jesus on an equal plane with these other ancient philosophers. He has no value to hide Jesus from history. He puts him up there with these other guys, you know. So he, he's not elevating Jesus in any way as he's talking about. It. He's just saying, as a philosopher, this wasn't good for the Jews to kill their own wise king. All right. And because, because Jerusalem was laid siege to in 67 A.D. and then destroyed in 70 A.D., right? He mentions that he lives on in his teachings, which might suggest that he was a real person who taught and thus passed on his wisdom in a written record. How can a guy live on in his teachings if he wasn't real? But he's living on because he, wrote, he, he had his disciples write things down about him and because of what they wrote down about him, you and I know about Jesus today. All right, let's talk about this guy, Flagin. Flagin in 80 to 140 AD. These are all very early guys, right? We're talking within the same one century, that first early church father period. These are people who either lived, were contemporaries of Jesus, contemporaries of the apostles, or contemporaries of the early church fathers, okay? He wrote a chronicle of history, around 140 AD. The original has been lost to time, but his writing is quoted once again by uh, <clears throat> Orange Julius here. Oh, no, Julius Africanus, all right? <laughs> Does it, are there even any Orange Juliuses anymore? Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I say Orange Julius? <laughs> like every mall had an Orange Julius. You go there and you get, oh, they were good. All right. Just trying to lighten the mood because I see some of you like, ah, ah, you know, all right. <laughs> His writing described an astrological event surrounding the crucifixion. So here's his writing here. Flagin records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar at full moon, so that tells us a time, of, a time period in the month, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth to the ninth hour. Let's talk about the weaknesses of this passage here. Right? And we, I've read passages, right? It says there's darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour in Matthew. It's not a first account of Jesus. It doesn't mention Jesus by name. That's another problem. And we don't have the original writing of Flagin. We don't have, we don't have the autographed copy. But the strength of this is, it tells us that in the, region of C, uh, 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 in the reign of Caesar, there was an unexpected darkness during the very hours that the Gospels record the darkness. So it's in the reign of Caesar who was reigning when Jesus was executed and in the time. And we have the biblical passage. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came, all over, came over all the land. The fact that they are so specific about the three hours that it lasted is very significant. Eclipses, right, they don't last for three hours long, right? You're going to have this one next, next year right in the area. <laughs> we will not be here, right? <laughs> we will be gone when that happens be out of town and uh but it's not going to be it's not going to last for three hours this is a matter of minutes right matter of minutes here's something else that flagin will write and then here's a picture of origin uh, that they have of him as an as an early church father and he says this now flagin in the 13th or 14th book i think of his chronicles not only ascribed to jesus a knowledge of the future events but also testified that the result corresponded to his predictions. And with regard to the eclipse in the time of Tiberius Caesar, in whose reign Jesus appears to have been crucified, and the great earthquakes which took place then, Jesus, while alive, was of no assistance to himself, meaning he didn't defend himself, right? 
And when it says that he was before Pontius Pilate, it says he didn't say anything, right? The only thing he said was, uh, you say that I am a king. You know, and what you say is the truth, and the pilot says the truth. But he didn't do anything to defend himself. He didn't say, hey, wait a minute, all these guys lied about me. Hold on a second. Yeah, he never did any of that. But that he arose after death and exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. So he's writing and talking about the story where Jesus comes in to his disciples in the locked upper room and he says, you know, look at my hands, look at the nail prints. He says to Thomas, and place your hand in my side. Stop believing and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. You know, my Adonai and my Theos, my Lord and my God. All right. Let me talk about one more unfriendly pagan source of limited evidential value here. Celsus. He's a Greek philosopher who wrote antagonistically towards the gospel accounts. He was negative about them. He did not like what was going on. He didn't care about them. And he's quoted by early church father Origen, the picture I just showed you. And this is what he says. Now, his, Celsus's words are in blue. So I, that's why I did this and, and made it so you can see where Origen is his speaking and then where he's quoting Celsus. He Celsius portrays the Jews having a conversation with Jesus himself, refuting him on many charges. First, he, Jesus, fabricated the story of his birth from a virgin. And he reproaches him because he came from a Jewish village and from a poor country woman who made her living by spinning. We would not have known what Mary might possibly have done. It seems here that maybe she was a spinner of producing cloth and stuff like that. He says that she was driven out by her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, when she was convicted of adultery. Then he says that after she had been driven out by her husband and while she was wandering disgracefully, she secretly bore Jesus. He says that because Jesus was poor, he hired himself out as a laborer in Egypt and there learned certain magical powers which the Egyptians are proud to have. He returned full of pride in these powers and gave himself the title of God. Now, there are things in there that we don't know about, like Jesus doesn't hire him. We don't have a record of Jesus hiring himself out as a laborer in Egypt. That's probably a corruption of the story that Joseph went down to Egypt. We don't know what Joseph did. Joseph probably did hire himself out as a laborer for a time, and then he comes back out of Egypt and comes back up into uh, the Palestinian area, and then he will settle back in Nazareth, right? And uh, so that's probably where that is. But let's talk about the evidence here. Some scholars question as to whether Celsus had any independent sources of uh, historical Jesus. Many think his attack is based on his knowledge of several New Testament texts that are already circulated. So they, what they're saying is they don't think that he would have had any knowledge of Jesus outside of the Bible. So he uses the Bible to attack an individual within the Bible, being Jesus. Here's the strengths of it. Celsus uses the proper name of Jesus. By refuting the birth story, he is admitting that the virgin birth story was a valid part of Jesus' lore. He's, he's, he's criticizing it, which meant that it was being told, you know, the same is true for his supposed abilities to do magical things. The fact that he's criticizing it would prove that Jesus was able to do magical things. We would call them miraculous things, like he healed people, he raised people from the dead, you know, he walked on water. And number four is he spent time in Egypt. Well, spending time in Egypt was a part of Jesus' history and his narrative, but not the way Celsus understood it or wrote about it. So I think Celsus was wrong obviously on that but he'd heard about that and probably got some of his facts mixed up uh, in some of that so there are some good things there but not everything that you would you would die on the hill for all right that takes us to our time and that our next thing the next two points we'll deal with are dealing with unfriendly pagan sources that have significant value because these are are they have limited value because we've looked at them so we'll look at some of these others uh, as we come back next week and we'll look at 
some more significant things that they say, and when we look at them, the, they're kind of like the final nails in the coffin as we look at this. But I hope that what you're seeing tonight is there was a lot of people who wrote about Jesus, some who loved Jesus and had a valid uh, uh, interest in, in, in uh, making Jesus a real person of history, like the gospel writers, the early church fathers. It would seem unlikely, though, that they would lie because the very teachings of Jesus say to be honest. You know what I'm saying? So you would lose yourself following the teacher if you lie to prop up the teacher. Okay? That's like, you know, I'm going to steal from the bank to make money. Well, that doesn't, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive. So I think that they're valid, uh, they're, they're, they're valid uh, witnesses. And then we have these other witnesses, these other pagan witnesses that have limited value because they don't say everything that we want them to say, but taken collectively as a whole, there's a lot of things that we can say about Jesus that clearly he was somebody in history because major, major Roman leaders had to deal with the stories about him and his followers and how they acted and it bothered them. So he couldn't have been just some made up figment of imagination, you know. It's not like, you don't go back and read stories about like, you know, like Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a lore, is, is folklore, right? I mean, there, we don't have evidences to show like all the things that his merry men did and all that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, but we have these things of Jesus. But, so I hope you, you see that. Do we have any questions that came in while we're, no, nothing's come in over the, <laughs> we've lost our internet following, I guess. I don't know. Uh, what about in here in, in, our, in our room tonight? Any questions that maybe I can try to address or answer? Are you feeling better about your faith and why you believe? Are you finding out that there's, there's more reason for your faith than just faith alone? There's nothing wrong with that, but, but we have evidences. God wants us to give an account, give a defense, a ready defense, right? A ready apology, apologia for our faith. And I hope that's what you're, you're getting out of here. All right, guys, that's our time. That's 7 o'clock. Thank you guys for being here. We'll pick up on, on this section next week and then... We'll wrap that up, and I'll go into the reliability of the gospel accounts themselves, and then we'll, that will be, we'll be done. So it'll take us through the end of October. So, all righty.